Okay, 12 o'clock. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to, glad to have you join us after Michael and I took the, the month off. Michael, I hope you were doing something good. I was busy working. <laughs> I was busy working in August. So hopefully you uh, you had a better excuse for not be, not being here on in August. More like this is the trial month. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Oh. All right. So so nothing good, nothing good for you either. Well, thank you everybody. Let me share my screen. Give me just a moment here. We'll get started. If I have the spire going through the middle of my head. Well, it looks, looks good. It looks like kind of a dunce hat. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> but, you know, that's the University of Toronto. That's for smart people. All right. All right. So we're good. We're good to go. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> my name's Neil Kalin. My co-host is Michael Simkin. And we have a guest today. We actually are going to have two guests today. But we're going to start off with that guy with the wavy hands. Mark and Mark, you know what? I, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so why don't you tell us? It's all right, Neil Kalen. Nobody knows how to pronounce my last name. It's Guthews like Matthews. Guthews like Matthews. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. You bet. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're gonna do what we're gonna do what we always do, right? We're gonna talk about cases. We're gonna summarize the cases. We're gonna give our Michael and I are gonna give our opinion on these cases. Mark Guthews is going to maybe chime in on our first two cases totally unprepared because he hasn't read those. That's because Mark read our third case, which was a court Dude. of appeal case, a doozy. three opinions, 56 pages. I can't stand these long opinions. Um, but No, it's lo lo long dissenting and concurring opinions. Yes. Yes. Very long. You you would think that they would just have a um a a common set of facts that they would use for all three opinions, but they just kept repeating the same things uh, yeah. over again in those opinions. You know, with a little bit extra here and there. But I don't know. It seemed to me it would be like a joint exhibit list for these for these judges, right? You know, well, let's you know, have a, a joint I mean, fact. There had to be one at trial, right? Yeah, probably, probably. Everybody likes to emphasize their own things. Everyone always likes to do that. So let's see what we've got going here. Okay, I gave you a general, right, general outline as to what we're going to be doing. So try and join my side here. We go. So here's our agenda today. All right. Uh, what's up with us? You know, guess what? This weekend is the first weekend to fall. So that's going to be my what's up with us slide. Then we've got a U.S. Supreme Court case. So we talked about that long Ninth Circuit case. Well, U.S. Supreme Court cases, they, they tend to be long as well. And then we have a California Court of Appeals case that sort of picks up where that U.S. Supreme Court um, finishes. And I don't know, I was I was going to do, I always do these little graphics on the side, you know, pictures that give you an idea as to what the case was about. And when I was doing the graphics for the Burns versus Wood case, I was thinking of trying to figure out a way to have California giving the finger to the U.S. Supreme Court. But then I thought, eh, you know, I should try to be a little bit more professional. So I'm not going to do that. We're going to interview Mark. And then we're going to talk about a case, uh, Morris versus West Hayden, which is really an, an interesting case. And I love cases with dissents. I love cases with concurrences because that means they're interested. Not everybody was going to look at it the same way. Although, as we said earlier, I'm not crazy when when each party writes their own 25-page opinion, you know, right. from the majority and the concurrence and the dissent. But we'll deal. We'll deal with that. Then we're going to talk to Lou Galupo, who's going to talk about an event that he has coming up in October. And you see, I've got another case there. I don't have any information about this case in our slides. There was an unpublished case that was picked up by the California Supreme Court. And it really ties in a little bit with what Lou is going to talk about. So we'll, we'll hear what Lou 
has to say, one of my favorite things about that shared development case, as you see there, standard for review, standard of review of a California Coastal Commission decision after an appeal to itself. And I <laughs> really love that. I love the fact that you can appeal to yourself, right? You pretty much know what's going to happen if, you were, if you're appeal, appealing the decision to yourself. So very interesting. Let's get started. We start off with, hey, what's up with us again this weekend, the first day of fall. I think it's Sunday. So welcome back, Michael. Welcome back, Neil. Let's get started. And here we're going to talk about the city of Grants Pass, Oregon versus Johnson. And some of you may have heard about this case, right? And you're, you may be thinking, Neil, this is a real property section webinar or podcast. Why are you talking about homeless? And the issue is because it directly affects real property, right? The issue is whether a city has a right to enforce an anti-sleeping or an anti-camping ordinance on public property. And Michael, I can't remember if we did this with you. I think it was a couple of years ago. We had a, 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 a personal injury case where, I mean, it was a sad story. We had a jogger. The jogger was jogging on private property. There was a homeless encampment on the private property. So the jogger veered off of the property into the street, was hit by a car, seriously injured, sued the property owner, right, for a dangerous condition on their property. Now, in that case, the courts did not go so far as saying that the property owner was responsible for the fact that there was a homeless encampment. And as a result of that, the, the jogger veered out of the way and was injured. But these cases, you know, affect all of us in one way or the other. They affect businesses, right? If there's, if there's encampments and there's tents, there's people sleeping on sidewalks in front of businesses. So I thought this would be a, a good case to talk about. Boy, let's look at my facts here. Pretty, pretty simple facts, right? So individuals experiencing homelessness brought a class action against the city, challenging the constitutionality of the city ordinance. That's the key of the constitutionality, which prohibited sleeping or camping on public property. And then it, the, the law provided for progressive consequences. In other words, you weren't immediately sent to jail the first time the police came out to see you. There was fines and there maybe there was exclusion orders. And finally, there could have been criminal prosecution for trespass. What were the, what were the plaintiffs alleging? They were saying, well, that violates the Eighth Amendment, that it was cruel and unusual punishment. <clears throat> Lower court, what happened there at the U.S. District Court, issued a permanent injunction prohibiting enforcement of the ordinance. Went up to the Ninth Circuit. They affirmed, you know, in relevant part. And then the city filed a petition for cert with, um, <coughs> with, the, with the U.S. Supreme Court, right? So the lower court said, no, we're going to enjoin the city from enforcing the ordinance. The Ninth Circuit affirmed that decision. <clears throat> and the U.S. Supreme Court decided to accept cert. What yeah. did the Supreme Court said? The Supreme Court said, well, we have to look at what's what the law is in the area. That's an important thing to look at, right? Especially for a U.S. Supreme Court. They said, you know what? There is there is precedent in California, or excuse me, in the Ninth Circuit, the Martin versus Boise case. That said what? Well, the Eighth Amendment, the cruel and unusual punishment clause, prohibits enforcement of these anti-sleeping, anti-camping ordinances if the number of homeless exceed the practically available shelter beds. And there's a number of questions here about what that would mean about practically available because some of these shelters are private, 
Some of these shelters have conditions. For example, there was talk there about one of the conditions is no smoking. Well, what do you do if you're homeless and you're a smoker? And you are offered a shelter, but the shelter requires no smoking. Or some of the private shelters require some kind of religious training or indoctrination or study um, as a part of being accepted into the shelter. Well, if you are not of that you know, religious persuasion, does that mean that the shelter bed is practically available for you? So the U.S. Supreme Court went on and said, well, let's look at the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. And when we look at that historically, we say it really addresses the method or the kind of punishment, right? That's what's being talked about, not the question of whether the government can criminalize certain activity or conduct. And the U.S. Supreme Court says, you know, the plaintiffs, they don't even contest that. They don't even contest that. What they do, though, however, is they say, well, we look at other precedent. They looked at the Supreme Court case of Robinson versus California that said you cannot criminalize addiction itself. You cannot say because somebody is an addict that they can be punished, right? And so they're basically trying to extrapolate from there and from the Martin case, the plaintiffs were trying to do to say, you know, cruel and unusual to say if somebody is involuntarily homeless, that you cannot ultimately criminalize that activity. So what, what happened here, you know, the, the city, <coughs> uh, the city first issues fines before seeking an, uh, removal, all of that stuff, not unusual, not unusual. So let's, let's see what we got here. There we go. Um, so I thought they had a lot of interesting information that they, that the Supreme Court took from, from various amicus briefs that were filed in this case. And there was a lot of amicus briefs, many of them from cities. And so I thought there was a lot of interesting statistical information. Do I know how accurate it is? No, I don't. But the court felt comfortable enough to put some of these things into their opinion, okay, such as what? <clears throat> um, homelessness is complex. Its causes are many. So maybe the public policy responses required to address it. People will disagree with the policy responses, which policy responses are best, and it's down at the bottom of your screen. They may experiment with one set of approaches only to find later that another set works better. And then if we look at some of the statistical quotes that they provided in this opinion, California is alone, is home to around half of those in the nation living without shelter on a given night. And each of the five states with the highest rates of unsheltered homelessness are all in the West Coast, California, Oregon, Hawaii, Arizona, and Nevada. <clears throat> and then what else? Officials in Portland, Oregon indicated that in the relevant period of time, over 70% of the approximately 3,500 offers of shelter beds to homeless were declined, right? So ultimately what happened in this case, ultimately the US Supreme Court said, this is not really an Eighth Amendment issue. That's not what we're talking about here. Michael, what did you think about when you read this case? Well, <clears throat> I concur and I dissent. How's that? <laughs> okay, there we go, all right. Yes, I like that. All right. so. I guess we have a lot of these five, three decisions. Anyway, okay, I have a couple of issues here. One issue is, didn't the court here say something about 30 days in jail does not qualify as something that is a disgraceful or could cause pain or terror? But I don't know. I think 30 days in jail is significantly not pleasant, significantly painful, significantly or potentially very dangerous. I don't understand why they think 30 days in jail is nothing. So I dissent with that statement. 
um, I see they're trying to get into this whole status, like it's homelessness a status. Um, I think it, it could be because you're homeless for several different reasons, you know, and it could be temporary, but whatever. Um, I do agree, concur that what they're doing is just putting it upon the states or local government. They're saying it's up to local government because it's like, like you said, it's a complex issue. The best people to decide is not the courts, you know, they want government to decide. So that part's okay. But I kind of think, you know, sleeping in the park because you're homeless and being punished, thrown in jail and they take away your stuff, which means they probably throw it away. Um, is kind of cruel, okay, as far as 30 days in jail. I think they're twisting some statements that Justice Marshall was saying, you know. Um, but, you know, that, that's what they do. They twist stuff a little bit. But uh, in the, I don't know, but in the big picture, I'm, I'm okay with states making decisions here. Um, but mm, I don't know about the ends justify the means or what they're trying to do here, but that, that's what I, I thought. Well, I, if if we look on the screen here, there's a there's a statement, the last sentence in the second to last full paragraph says those are societal issues for legislatures to address. And really it becomes once once the courts get involved, you're asking the court to make a whole bunch of decisions that maybe are not appropriate for the judiciary. And I know in LA, there was issues where judges were making decisions about what was appropriate or not. Now, maybe the judges are receiving all sorts of good advice. I don't know about that. But isn't that why we vote for a legislature to help make those kinds of decisions as opposed to a judge saying something is constitutional or not constitutional. Something is permitted under the contract, not permitted under the contract, right? Establishing the boundaries as opposed to establishing individual rules. And so to me, I think that was a big part of what this U.S. Supreme Court was trying to get at. I see Mark sort of nodding his head. I don't know if he's you know kind of lost here or if, if he's looking at something else or if he wants to comment. Yes, I do. So I want you to go back one slide. And I think that this is sort of the the, the crux of the matter. Um, I don't know if you can, but in it, it said that um, because... This one, Mark? Yeah, that's, Mark, that's the one. The, okay. And that's the one. And I'll take you to officials in Portland, about a third of the way down, indicate okay. that between 2022 and January 2024, 70% of their approximately 3,500 oh, shelter beds were offered but declined so i've been I, I i have done a little work uh you know with the homeless community the brunt of this decision before the united states supreme court stepped in fell to the cities we had cities that basically could do nothing uh to move people off their property beachfront city can't move people off the property because they don't have housing for those people. And so the communities have scrambled. They've purchased uh, older apartment buildings. They've found ways to designate access for the homeless. And the homeless pass on the offer. Not 30% of them went for it. I'm not saying, oh, it's their, you know. It, what we have found on a personal level is if it's women and children, they'll take advantage of the housing. If it's men, it's a pretty long shot as to whether they're going to take advantage of the housing. After the local community has gone through the, the expense, the tax, the brain damage of, of, of providing housing, which isn't used, I think I think everybody in the room, and I think that's what you see in the Supreme Court decision is, hey, man, if that number was 100 percent and that, you know, we've gone to the expense, we've gone to the brain damage, we've gone to the effort, we're now offering it to people and people are taking advantage of it, getting their lives turned around, getting things cleaned up. 
I, I think the Supreme Court would be maybe reconsidering or coming out with a different decision. What they're saying is, hey, the court's idea of, hey, local municipality, you can't intervene until you're able to provide housing. That That's not working. Well, and, and what you have here, right, you've got a, as so many of these tough cases involve, there's a balance, right? There's a balance of individuals who are complying with the law, who want to walk down the sidewalk, um, you know, who want to have access to businesses, right, without being interrupted, right? And that has to be balanced against. And, you know, I see on your your background, you know, Mark, you, you've, you've got the balance, right? You've got the, the balance right there in the background. And that's what the court did. That's what the court did. This court came out one way, right? Are there other courts that came out different way? Yes, right? The, the Ninth Circuit came out differently, and I'm sure there's others. For those who are interested in this issue, again, there's a concurrence by Justice Thomas, and there's a dissent as well. So you might want to take a look at that and use that as fodder for whatever argument you are on the issue. Okay, Let's so so one. wait, wait, Neil, I just want to say, yeah. you know, this balancing part, there's a difference because I've seen this where there's a sidewalk that is not just covered with homeless tents and everything else, and it extends to the street and what you see them doing all over the place and sleeping in a park. Okay. I think it's very, very different, you know, when you're balancing this stuff. Um, and the other thing was for civil, civil procedure, I was looking through the dissent and they didn't address the due process clause of how they're enforcing these laws. I think that's another big area if people want to like go against it. Although I'm all about cleaning up the streets, but I see the due process thing. And I also completely agree with the dissent that when it said sleep is a biological necessity, not a crime. Okay. All right. Well, good. Good, Michael. Thank you. We appreciate that input. So let's hear what you're going to say about the people, um, Burns versus Wood. And here we have a California case. And again, we have an indigent homeless person who here is residing in a park, right? So the other case had to do with public property. So it could have been a park, could have been a sidewalk, for example. Here we're talking about somebody who is residing in a park in Fountain Valley, California. The park is near a hospital where this person was receiving treatment, say she had cancer and she had heart disease. The city was pursuing this individual, filed a criminal complaint against her for being in the park past closing time, right? So that, that goes to your issue, Michael, where, where you would you know tend to be you know, balance, right? That on the side of the, the homeless person based on your last comment. And the individual said, well, wait a minute. I have a I have a defense. I'm not arguing that I wasn't sleeping in the park. I'm not arguing that I had no mens rea. I knew exactly what I was doing. But I have a defense and my defense is it's a necessity for me to be here because that is close to where I am receiving treatment. While the criminal case was pending, the city brought a civil action against Wood, that same individual. Okay, Now, Wood had a appointed attorney for her in the criminal case, but did not have an appointed attorney in the civil action. So she basically was representing herself, presumably with the assistance of the criminal attorney, but she was representing herself in the action. At trial, the court said, you know, Wood, the city is doing what they're allowed to do. You're culpable for violating this rule. But the court did not immediately kick her out. The court waited five months before issuing a judgment prohibiting Wood from basically remaining in the park. Well, whether this was coincidence or not, but a week later, one week after the injunction, five months later, okay, what happened to be acquitted in the criminal case? Okay, um, the court said, "Well, yes, there there was a necessity defense um, in the criminal case, and she was acquitted of the criminal of the criminal action." 
So what it would do would have healed the civil sure. action injunction against her and said basically two things, which is, you know, I had a defense in the criminal action. I should have been allowed to have that defense in the civil action. And if nothing else, the civil action should have been stayed pending the criminal action. <clears throat> so this case went up to the California Court of Appeal, the fourth appellate district. And what did, uh, what did the court say? Well, the trial court, you abused your discretion in failing to stay the case pending the criminal case. So basically saying, you know what? This criminal case said, you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to delay, right? So the U.S. Supreme Court in our prior case said, cities, you can take actions that you deem necessary to clean up your streets, clean up your parks, uh, you know, prevent whatever disruption that causes. <clears throat> and the California Court of Appeal said, well, well, that may be fine when you're talking about an Eighth Amendment claim, but that's not what we're dealing with here. So, you know, the, you, this can all be delayed by months if there happens to be a criminal action as well as a civil action. Okay. Now, you can see here the court, the uh, appellate court said, you know, there's no absolute obligation to stay the civil action, right? But you know, we need to look at the circumstances here. We're dealing with the same individual. We're dealing with the same claims, same lawyers, right? The the appellate court said something along the lines of, we've got to be concerned that the attorneys for the city could not have direct contact with Wood in the criminal action because she was represented by a lawyer, but can have direct contract in the civil action. Well, that, and the court of appeals says, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, we've got to take all of these things into consideration. <clears throat> and then the court said, what about issuing an injunction? That's within the equitable jurisdiction of the courts. And, you know, under the circumstances, right, where she is, you know, it's at night, alleges that she wasn't bothering anybody or interfering with anybody. And she needed to be close to her hospital. So again, even this court recognized the homeless issue is a very complex issue that is the subject of much debate, right? So, but this is really, this is really in a way undercutting what happened in the Grand pa Grants Pass case. Now, yes, it's a different legal theory, but if you look at the consequences, the consequences is the... Burns versus Wood case makes it harder for a city to determine what it believes are the best actions to take with regard to homeless, violating, anti-sleeping, anti-camping ordinances. Michael, tell us what you think about this one. This is one of those examples where the facts, you know, are what's critical. Um, starting with where is the jurisdiction in which county is this, Neil? Right? <laughs> this is Orange County? Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, Orange County, okay. right. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's a little bit different than if it was like the Bay Area, um, but the facts are different. I mean, some of the facts I just don't agree with, okay? Um, it like, says something about, I mean, okay, she's sick, she says she's being treated at this hospital, great. She also said she has nothing. So the necessity of her being there to be treated, or is it because she had nothing? She said she owns nothing, except I assume a laptop, because somehow she was, I think, trying to do make an appearance at a Starbucks on, on the, okay. the, the, the trial. But she's, at home. she's just homeless, okay? But, so I don't know about that, but I completely agree with the abuse of discretion because of the criminal case not being stayed or not the civil case not being stayed because of the criminal case you know um they, they should have done that it made no sense okay plus picking on her just made no sense whatsoever the way they went about doing it um but the biggest thing was the courts at, um, at the appellate level 
But looking at the facts, I mean, the officer was lying. Was it that the, the, they talked about something about the officer is testifying? Oh, yeah, I offered her a ride to a homeless shelter. But then he also admitted that that city has no homeless shelters. So then he's like, well, we would find her a homeless shelter someplace. Okay. But it's just whenever you have the evidence, like the, the officer testifying and they're lying, it just opens the door for the court to say, you know, I'm just disregarding what you're saying. You're just a liar. You're just a pretext. What are you trying to do here? Okay. Um, so Michael, but, I, I disagree with you that, that the officer may have been lying or bending the truth. The officer said I offered to take her to a homeless shelter did not say offer to take her homeless shelter within the city. You know, so there were nearby homeless shelters. So, you know, maybe you don't think uh, Yeah, no, I, got, I understand I said that, but I just think they just thought that something is small right about that. But in the big picture is what you said before. You have this criminal case and this civil case. So the injunction is all about equity. And the trial court should have exercised a modicum of equitable jurisdiction here and say, you know what? Right now, let's not do this injunction thing, okay? It's just put it off for a while. Okay, and what's the comment by the judge? He said something about, um, you know, it'd be nice if you would have a lawyer and Woods responded, yeah, but I can't afford one, I'm homeless, you know? I think, and then she she wasn't mean. They said that there was no evidence that Wood was disruptive or violent or she disrupted any park activities. You know, they wanted to plant seeds. She's like, I'm not in the way. I can move. They can plant grass, whatever. So. So, Michael, I agree with you that the, the judge in this case did not come out very well in the appellant opinion. The judge seemed very harsh and dismissive. Um, but I am going to take issue with something you said, which is, well, maybe, you know, maybe they should have waited. Well, they did wait. They waited five months, you know, after the decision before issuing an injunction. Now, I don't know if they knew that there was going to be, a, a you know, a, a, um, a basically a, def a defense verdict, you know, an acquittal in the in the criminal action, whether whether that was known or whether that was a surprise. But it, it wasn't like wasn't like they took action immediately, right? You know, that that's half almost half a year that they waited before taking action. So let's let's turn over to Mark, and then we'll interview Mark, and we'll get on to our our last case that I want to talk to Mark about as well. I I actually don't know that this is necessarily undercutting the Supreme Court decision. Uh, I think that this is sort of an example. And yes, it was in the courts. So by definition, it undercuts the decision. But it is an example of courts trying to find a way to help her. Um, and, and I do think that that occurs like that goes on people in this position are are assisted one way or another to the best ability of the people involved so mark mark we we don't disagree on that point right that i think in both of these cases the judges and the justices want to do the right thing and if it were an easy call, these cases would not go up to a court of appeal or would not go up to the U.S. Supreme Court, right? These are tough calls. These are tough decisions to make. And then, you know, we, we either abide by them or we don't. Hopefully, as lawyers, you know, we, we accept precedent and we act upon it as precedent. Of course, it's our job to, you know, maybe make a distinction if it's in our client's best interest. But 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 these are these are the decisions that we have. So Mark, you know what? I'm going to turn it over. All right. I don't know if M Michael has any questions he wants to ask you about yourself or your practice. But if you do, Michael, great. If not, let's just let Mark talk away. Well, I can overview for a minute. I can give an elevator speech, and then Michael can jump in and and uh, and talk about it. But the bottom line is that I started out of UCLA. I started as an HOA manager and I did that for five, six years and realized that I wasn't going to be able to get a house uh, because the industry just doesn't pay enough. But I went to my boss and he said, look, he said, take every other Wednesday off and follow your vendors around. They have businesses. You can see how they do things. And, um, and when you find it, let me know. 
years later, I went back to Dennis and I said, gosh, what a generous, generous thing you did. And he said, I thought I was going to have to replace you the next day. He says, this, this process bought another two years. And I did go ahead and continue to manage uh, through my first couple of years of law school. And then uh, at University of San Diego, where, where you're going to hear from Lou Galupo. And, uh, and, uh, and then I, I started working in the HOA industry as an attorney. So uh, I worked for a while as an HOA attorney. I worked for a while doing subdivision work, which is just for anybody on the call. It's the process of breaking big pieces of land into little land and getting that process or those lots blessed by the California Department of Real Estate. I worked under the great Scott Jackson uh, and uh, did that for a number of years. And then in 2009, uh, all my developer clients really hit the wall. And so I started Community Legal Advisors. So we're now 15, 15 years old, and uh, we got 500 clients, and we do general counsel for those associations, and we do assessment collection. So I, uh, I serve uh, on a couple of different boards. I serve on the California Lawyers Association. I'm the chair elect behind Mark Allen Wilson. Um, and uh, I want to take this minute, the second I would be remiss if I didn't talk to your viewers and just say, hey, come join the California Lawyers Association Real Property Law Section. Uh, you're going to get a law review magazine. You're going to get a monthly update with current real estate cases. You're going to get the annual law uh, conference. You, you, you continue to join us at Woo Woo. Um, my goal is really to help people understand HOAs uh, because they're just so easy to poke fun at. And I think that uh, if, if people really understand what's going on, maybe we'll all do a little better at it. Okay, Mark, okay. I, I have a comment about HOAs. Sure. Okay. So to me, an HOA is like a fiefdom and it's run by a bunch of despots that are on the board and they can do whatever they want to do. Okay, that's what I think. I just want to know from your point of view, is does all the power of the HOA to ratify every decision they make, right or wrong, is it still the business judgment rule? Well, you put a lot in your question. It's a set. <laughs> Let's back up. It is difficult. We have a, a case out there called Palm Springs versus Park in which uh, board president went out and hired a handyman to do a series of roofing jobs. And of course, that turned out very poorly. And the association came back and sued her and said, hey, you know, breach of fiduciary duty. When you're on a board of directors, you hire a licensed insured vendor and they do a professional job. You just went out and hired Bob the Builder. And uh, the court came back and said to your, to your uh, point, hey, if we start holding individual directors, however well-mannered, responsible for, for non-business decisions, bad decisions, uh, we're not going to have anybody serve on a board of directors. So there is a tremendous fiefdom to your, to your statement, but every association, every board of directors is re-elected every couple of years. And so this is the this is the real issue. If you care, if you believe this is a fiefdom, and and I call it the NFL rule. Uh, you know, if things are running so poorly that you're willing to turn off Monday night football and go down and attend a meeting and get involved and served on the board, you're going to get you're going to be on the board and you're going to have a say in that fiefdom, if you will, the three or five or seven people who happen to serve on the board. But if you don't care, then that system is going to continue to run. That system has to run. Every time some genius legislature, legislator tries to pass a law that says, oh, HOAs, we should defund them or make them illegal. The city, the League of California Cities comes sprinting to the legislature and said, oh, no, these are private groups of people. These are homeowners. And they were elected by their peers to represent the association. So they may be making bad decisions, 
But that's as easy as electing them out and replacing them with somebody who can make a good decision. Yeah, I, I get called all the time and I, I repeat what you just said, you know, get involved. And every so often I get a call back, yeah, I got involved, but I can't, I'm powerless. They, they won't listen to me, you know. So, so I have to tell you, there are, uh, there's, there's mechanical things in place, right? So, uh, my own son-in-law, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, an owner within the association and he got himself elected for the sole purpose of firing the association's manager. So, you know, that was his. That was his goal. You have some authority, but sometimes the person who's been keeping the machine going for 5, 10, 15 years, despite the absolute non-involvement or the lack of education of the people serving on the board, the person who's made sure that there's insurance and that it names the association, there's liability and property and understands the difference. The person who... Uh, you know, make sure the landscapers are operating on the property and, and knows who the landscapers are and what valves don't really work and what, you know, why we need to put solar over there, but not over there. That person is paid, you know, $35,000 a year as an entree and maybe 65, you know, as a 20 year associate. And, you know, your, your, you know, that person has a place at the table um, because they've run your community for a long time. So if your friend ran with the goal of replacing management, they might have hit a wall. If your friend ran with a goal of, uh, you know, getting three bids in place, let's make sure that we are uh, going out to bid on things. Let's make sure that we're, you know, doing that kind of stuff then operating the corporation the way it's supposed to do, it's pretty easy to find like-minded individuals who are moving in the same direction. So yeah. Mark, I'm uh, going to stop you there. I got to stop you there. We got to get to our next case. We got to allow some time for Lou. Okay. I, I think, I think Michael, we're probably going to need to lengthen <laughs> the what's up with us meetings. because We are always running late. So let's just, let's jump in. I'm not going to go over all of these slides on Morris versus West Hayden. It's a Ninth Circuit case, fascinating case involving an HOA, right? Which is why I wanted to talk about this with Mark here. Wait, is, let me get my hot chocolate first. I mean, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You have a family that that held, before they moved into this, this association, they held a big Christmas display and essentially a party, you know, um, outside their home. Uh, you know, I am reminded of some of those Christmas movies, you know, where they try to light up, you know, so where they can see their house from space, you know, whichever Chevy one Chase. that was. Excuse me? Chevy Chase. Yeah, Chevy Chase. <clears throat> and so they they want to move. They want to move to this other association, West Hayden. They enter into a contract. They contact the HOA to find out if what they've been doing is okay. The HOA basically says, no, you know, that's going to disturb the neighborhood. And the HOA, in an earlier draft of a letter that was not sent to this purchaser, made some comment uh, essentially addressing that this is a, you know, a, a Christmas display and we have non-Christians or we have atheists in our community and they're not going to take too kindly of that. The person goes ahead, <laughs> purchases their property anyway, for two years, holds a huge event. This is not just putting up a few lights, you know, or a few hundred lights. An entire event. They've got animals. They give away free hot chocolate. They, they have hundreds hot of thousands of people coming, girls. <laughs> <laughs> coming into their property. After doing this for two years, they file against the HOA. The HOA did not file against them to stop it. The individual filed against the HOA saying, you've discriminated against me based on religion. I, I don't really understand how they were the ones who brought the case before the HOA tried to stop them. 
But nonetheless, that happened. The the um the the trial court, the the jury awarded for the plaintiff. The judge issued um, a judgment as a matter of law. What I'm saying is the equivalent of a JNOV. And then it was then it was appealed. And the appellate court in three different opinions, right? The the majority, a concurrence, and a, and a dissent, basically said, well, there were some problems here. They divided up the Fair Housing Act into different different sections and said, we've got a problem with one of them. And, you know, the, the majority agreed on one of them. They disagreed on the on the other ones. And the case is going back for a new trial. Okay, so it's, it's just a fascinating case. I'm not going to go into it if you have time. Again, everybody who's on the call today, you're going to get a copy of these slides tomorrow. You can take a look. You can see, you know, some really interesting things, right? An estimated 200,000 lights, 30 volunteers, musical guests, a choir, a candy machine. You know, it was just unbelievable the event that they had. So, Mark, have you ever had something like this where you've had a, a potential fair housing claim brought against an association you represent? Fair housing claims are common. Uh, they're sort of a trope in our industry. Uh, the problem, of, I don't know about the problem. You know, the issue with fair housing is as soon as you say that they're a problem, you then depreciate the very real interests of the people who are making the claim. Um, and, and, and I guess, so I'll go back to my, there are problem. There are problem for my community associations to recognize, uh, before they come, I put on a training every year on, you know, preparing for avoiding fair housing claims, not, and, and my first slide is look, discrimination is not acceptable. Here's how the courts want you to handle a fair housing claim. They didn't do it here. The uh, the courts really want you to follow California's employment law and fair housing and employment, and they want you to hold a hearing with that person. Say, hey, what do you feel? Then hold a hearing with the person that they feel is discriminating against them. And that's one of the issues that came up here was the court was like, yeah, I don't think the association's discriminating against these people. Uh, so now we need to go back and look individually at each party. Um, so it's a, it's an issue. You, you've got to know that it's out there. It's also a cheap trick. So if I represent a homeowner as against the association, I take a look at the person and I'm like, wow, female Asian. Good. One of my claims is going to be fair housing because, uh, you know, it, it forces a conversation. It forces the association to come to the table. And I think that's kind of what you saw here the court responding to that reality. Well, to me, I, Michael, I'm going to let you have a last word and for one minute so we can get to our second guest. But to me, I was I was kind of flabbergasted at one of the issues because that that the response seemed to be problematic. And I understand that, you know, they they should not have mentioned the, the religious aspect of it. But there was so much other evidence having to do with legitimate reasons to deny what the prospective homeowner was asking for. And the court seemed to say, well, as long as there's even some slight element that's not legitimate, then that completely, I'll use my word that I used earlier, undercuts all the legitimate reasons. And it's like, can't, can't you consider these things in, in context? It was the homeowner who asked. The homeowner was told you're going to be violating, you know, uh, you're going to be creating a nuisance. You're going to be violating our light laws. You're going to be violating our noise laws. You're going to be violating our traffic rules. You know, all those reasons. And in a letter that wasn't even sent to them where they mentioned the fact that it's a Christmas display that wasn't even sent to them. They got it, obviously, you know, through discovery. Yeah, right. like, I don't know. I, I just to me, that was kind of problematic that you could take something that was such a small part of the overall reason and elevate that to such a high level. Michael, real quick, what do you have to say? So the facts of this are unique. I understand why they actually didn't want it, but what I don't understand from a legal point 
is the homeowner association didn't, I mean, they said clearly. Uh oh, Michael froze up. Wants to do the program, but they took no official action, meaning what and ended it, or or does that it doesn't matter? It's maybe Mark knows. I mean, to me, if the HOA says a letter, thou shalt not have this type of Christmas display with two hundred thousand lights and everything, that I should I'm going to stop with whatever I'm doing and file a lawsuit. That's what I thought the property owner was going to do, but the court seemed to also think by not taking an official action. That was a defense to the HOA. I thought that that was interesting because I certainly would have encouraged my client to make a claim. The only thing I can think about is that these people went to the fair housing issue so quickly uh, that I think the association was caught off guard. And so now they're kind of standing there saying, do we want to go into a lawsuit over this issue or not? And then, of course, she helped them by suing because then, of course, they can tender it to their insurance. Uh, and and go through these cases without having to come out of pocket for it, but it's it's I agree with you. It, it, like there was definitely a non-action there. Yeah, that's the court said. The court said point to some concrete adverse impact or something. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating case for everybody you know to read to kind of get a different perspective on all of this. I have to tell you, my reading was especially reading the concurrence and the dissent, that the plaintiff was basically a disagreeable person. <laughs> it really was. And one of the HOA's initial responses, you know, we don't want to be involved in litigation. Well, guess what? <laughs> they proved themselves right. This person litigated, <laughs> right? But what so did the judge like, do at the end, in the trial court? What happened at the end? It got well, River, it got yeah. J-N-O-V. Yeah, yeah, but but now they're going to have to have re relitigate the whole case because it went got sent back for a new trial. So it's because there were some evidentiary there were some evidentiary issues. Let's somebody, turn it over. As somebody who represents associations, I am happy to see the courts going away from their wholesale. Oh, there's a discrimination claim. Therefore, everybody's okay. got to stop. And so you know, going back and saying, well, is there actually discrimination? That's a that, that's a darn thing that needed to happen five, 10 years ago. And we'll, we'll see if this, you know, gets results in another published case about what level that has to rise to, to be successful. Okay. Well, Lou, if you're with us, if you're paying any attention, um, we want to bring you in. The reason we're bringing you in because Lou, you've got a program through the real property section that's coming up next month. So why don't you tell us about that program? Great, thanks. Hey, I appreciate it very, very much, Neil. Michael, thank you very much. Neil, again, thank you for having me on this podcast. Um, the, the program, of course, originates out of the fact that we have a jurisdictional issue as real estate lawyers and, and to deal with California Coastal Commission uh, as it exists today. And there's been an evolution from the beginning of the Coastal Act and even before that. And so, so today it seems that jurisdiction, we have jurisdiction creep um, with California Coastal Commission. That's one of the issues and only one of 10 issues that we're trying to bring forward. Well, the program that you have before you right now, navigating the sale of coastal properties in today's turbulent climate deals with primarily the sale of homes and what the disclosure requirements are related to those homes, whether it's existing or new development, but it can also apply to any other type of development along the coast. So it's going to be October 18th. It runs from 11 o'clock. We've expanded it to five. Um, there's going to be a primary speaker talking about or a keynote speaker talking about uh, the economics of what's going on along the coast and what happens if all of the homes or some portion of the homes in any area is removed from the actual coast or beach or cliffs itself. And there's a real possibility of that happening since, since things are happening in places like Pacifica, San Clemente, and most recently in, in Palos Verdes, that people may not be able to rebuild at this point in time. And even if they can, they might not be able to get insurance. 
So what happens when those houses start to trade and the real estate professional comes in and wants to talk about and needs to disclose along with the sellers on what those issues are? That's what this program's about. First panel, the very first panel will likely be made up of mostly coastal lawyers and, and a handful of elected officials that are willing to talk about the issues that they have with the Coastal Commission. The second panel will be made up of, of uh, Neil, will actually be on that panel and talking about how disclosure forms are created. So thank you, Neil, deeply appreciate it. And we're looking, and, and at this point, there's practicing realtors that will be on that panel as well. And they'll, I'll be the, the moderator for both of these panels, just exploring the issues. Now, in, in the big sense, there's 10 influences that have come into being that did not exist prior to uh, 2010. And there was a brand new regime that came into place in 2011. And the policies that currently exist today are from that new regime. So we're just going to explore that and then try to explain, how do you disclose it? I, I, I suspect, Neil, handing this back to you, that dealing with sheer development versus California Coastal Commission, we'll be talking about one of those issues, jurisdiction. So jurisdiction and process. So I'm going to hand it back to you. Well, thank, thanks, Lou. And for those who are listening, uh, Brooke, who is our administrative assistant at, at um, CLA, has posted a link in the chat for those of you who want to sign up. Now, you, you mentioned, Lou, that it's been extended to five. Now, part of that is just like a, a social networking part. Isn't that correct? Or is it all, you know, lecture or meeting? Right now, it's set up. It's set up. The goal is to have it set up for two, um, two one and a half hour sessions, one hour and 20 minutes, one hour and 25 minutes. So we're not 100 percent sure yet. We're we're talking about having some sort of social socializing afterwards because the we're, we're probably going to have somewhere between 85 and 100 people there depending upon who's going to be there helping from california lawyers association it's a limited venue at 75 people it's up or, up at pepperdine university um it's a gorgeous uh room with an ocean view with full ocean views up there and we're doing this because this is an educational type facility so, and this is an educational program in every sense of the word. So we'll, we'll see about that. Okay. That. All right. Well, that, that's good to know, Lou. And clarify some one thing else for me. Yes. Which is, you know, we're, we're the CLA, the California Lawyers Association. We know we have listeners from throughout the state. Will this be available as a web, webcast or some kind of, live streaming event or do you have to show up in person if you want to gain that information great question i appreciate the question you have to show up this okay. there was there was a decision made far above my pay grade that everybody has to be there but it will appear eventually on uh the cla website for consumption by anybody else that wants to see it Okay, so I'm I'm glad you said that, Lou. For those who are listening, you know, if you want to reach out to Lou, you want to reach out to Mark. Again, you're going to get a copy of all these slides tomorrow. You get one hour of free MCLA, so you could look up their information. Their contact information is in the slides, and you see here about our upcoming events. And for the one you were just talking about, Lou, I put live and webcast. So. I'll need to remove webcast in the future. Um, I think originally that we're gonna you were gonna try to do it in some kind of dual capacity. We were and like you say, there were there are others that have made an executive decision. So no no problem with that. You see uh, what else is coming up when co-owners disagree, and I believe that's uh, one of our fellow XCOM members, which is Eli, who's gonna be talking about partition actions. I think. And guess what? We've got a live event. The, the fall soiree is being brought back, and that's being brought back in San Diego. So go on to CLA's RPLS website. So it's 
calawayslawyers.org, and you can find the Real Property tab, and you can find out all about these events. And next month, Michael, we're going to go right back to your bailiwick. We're going to be talking about a couple of landlord-tenant cases, really, I think, very big cases that are affecting all California residents. We're going to talk about those as well. We're going to have another guest next month. When is next month? Thursday, October 17th at 12 noon. Mark, thank you for joining us. There was just so much to talk about. Um, so, you know, I know you could have gone on for a lot longer, and I appreciate you giving us the time that you have. Michael, as always, thank you. Lou, thank you. Michael, why don't you close us out? Well, just thank you for joining us. And, um, and Mark and Lou, thank you for uh, helping us understand a couple of new things. And Coastal Commission, I get a lot of calls. This is something I think I need to attend. Look forward to it. We can get you a ticket. Let's do it. <laughs> right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.